Okay, so as Jen mentioned, we are recording. Uh, basically, what's going to happen in the event that you have to leave early, or if you have a friend who missed this presentation and wants to tune in, we will be uh, publishing the link so you can watch it on our SOE Hub YouTube channel uh, at any point, um, you know, after it's been published. So I'm going to get started. Uh, you know, Jen, keep your room open for any late arrivals. That's perfectly fine. Um, this is more of a relaxed setting. We are talking about industry hour today. And this week, our industry hour episode is featuring electrical engineering and computer and systems engineering and also the duels that come along with it. Um, we have some great panelists today. And basically, um, our message from the hub is that if you are an undeclared engineer, or perhaps you're an engineer who's just interested in learning more about these majors and you want to switch, you can always book a meeting with your hub advisor for more information regarding how to do that and what that would look like for you individually. So I am going to share my screen and we're going to get started. Okay. So, as I mentioned, today's industry hour features computer and systems engineering and electrical engineering. Uh, thank you for joining us. Our agenda this evening is going to be that I'm going to give you a brief presentation of what our career center uh, does on campus because they play an integral role in assisting students in not only finding internships and co-ops, but they also help students find their dream jobs ultimately. So they're a resource that we really encourage, especially in your first year, for you to connect with them. Then we're going to introduce our wonderful panel. We have two Rensselaer alumni with us and a current student who are gonna offer their perspectives about what it was like here at RPI and what they're doing now. Um, so that's going to be our interview and then we're going to leave a lot of time for you guys to ask questions to our uh, panel. So let's begin with the Center for Career and Professional Development. It's a mouthful. We call it CCPD for short. Uh, acronyms are everywhere on campus so that's just another one for you to remember. Um, we have two designated engineering career counselors here in the School of Engineering. We have Emily Seals and Kristen Kettering. Both of their contact information is here, but really what you would want to do is go to the Career Center and you can connect with either one of them. They are familiar with all of the ins and outs of the interview process. The Career Center can offer you mock interviews. They can offer you different things that you can do to strengthen your candidacy as either an intern or perhaps as an engineer upon graduation. So how to connect with the Career Center. One of the things that we discuss in the hub is that all students should set up their Handshake account sooner than later. You can actually make appointments right through Handshake. The information is here, rpijoinhandshake.com. It's also on the CCPD website. The Career Center offers drop-in hours or you can schedule individual appointments. We have an upcoming career fair at the end of September. So if you wanted to participate, um, yes, first year students can go to a career fair. It's not that you are committing to anything. It's really important for you to learn the ropes, listen to what people are saying and what they're wearing, all of the things that go in that are involved in a career fair. It's really just to be a fly on the wall is perfectly fine at this time as a first year student. They offer professional headshots in the Career Center. They have different workshops where you can strengthen your professional development skills. They even have a clothing closet. So if you did land an interview and you don't have the proper attire to wear, you can actually sort through their stuff to find something. So they're kind of a one-stop shop when it comes to all things career planning. You could schedule an appointment to meet with Emily or Kristen at any time. And as I mentioned, you can do that through Handshake. Now, one of the things that we generally talk about and the Career Center talks about is where 
electrical and computer system engineers work, or basically any engineering major, where do they work? These are just a short list of some of the businesses that you might recognize um, that have employed our engineers in the past. So this is obviously just a snapshot. The list is quite endless and you can see in the Career Center what relationships we have with what employers. So this is just something to give you a grasp, but there's a lot more content waiting for you if you check it out. Now, according to last year's survey results in the Career Center, the average salary for a computer and systems engineer was $89,546. Uh, the range is anywhere between 65,000 and 118. So um, computer and systems was the fifth highest engineering earners for the class of 2022. And electrical is quite similar. Um, we do have a range of all of our engineering majors right here, just for your reference. Um, as this is an undeclared program, it is always good to kind of take a look at what the other engineering focuses are, are doing as well. And then as far as electrical engineering, it's quite close to the computer and systems model where it's around 80,000 average and a range between 60 and 115, according to the class of 2022 reporting. And again, there's your credentials. So all this information is on the uh, Career Center website. It's CCPD, um, you could Google it or you can just find it in the RPI info page. So now what we're going to do is I am going to uh, have all of our panelists introduce our, themselves and what they're going to do at this point is obviously uh, share their name and their work history with you, where they're from, where they live now, and the degree that they earned while they were here at RPI and perhaps a degree at, externally and what, where they went to school. So we're going to start with Alyssa. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Partridge. Uh, I graduated from RPI in 2017 with a dual degree, <clears throat> excuse me, a dual bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and computer and systems engineering. Uh, after that, I joined a company called BAE Systems where I'm acting as an electrical engineer, primarily doing digital circuit design, targeting uh, field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. I'm frequently um, implementing digital signal processing algorithms onto these devices. Uh, and while I'm working there, I got my master's degree at WPI, uh, also in electrical engineering. And I currently live in the state of New Hampshire. Great. Thanks, Alyssa. And Saeed? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Saeed Sayat Alasami. And uh, let's see, and uh, work history. I started as a test engineer on the space shuttle in 1975. Um, and uh, about a year and a half later, my manager had left and joined a startup. Startups were a thing back in those days too. And he recruited me to go join them. It was a company that made word processing machines. This is before the PC was invented and introduced. Uh, and uh, I was there until IBM introduced the PC and that date was over very quickly. Uh, the price of our product dropped from $30,000 to $30. Uh, and uh, I joined Bell Labs then, and in the next uh, 31 years, I was a design engineer, supervisor, uh, director, VP, uh, in various functions. I was general manager for a couple of different divisions. And uh, let's see, then I retired in 2013. And then since then, I've been doing the Private equity consulting, business turnaround. I was president of a startup that ran, that did conversational AI. And I was chairman of a sports tech company that we just sold. And uh, with any kind of luck, I am going to retire, retire, retire one of these days. Uh, so that's about work history. I was born and raised in Iran. Uh, I came to the US the day I started RPI. That was the shock of my life could barely speak English. And uh, I got my degree in 1974, BS in electrical engineering, and in 1975, master's degree in electrical engineering. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Josh, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hey everyone, I'm Josh Pett. I'm a current senior in computer systems engineering. Uh, I have 
just got back from my r semester working as a digital communications engineer at MITRE in Bedford, Mass. And I'll be doing another co-op in the spring at Tesla on their uh, vehicle hardware team doing audio software engineering. So very much into the whole signal processing stuff. Um, yeah, I'm from central Massachusetts and uh, I have one semester after this. Fantastic. So now you know our panelists, we're going to begin with some questions. Um, just some general housekeeping. If you have any questions at the end for our panelists, please put them in the chat. We will be addressing them all at the end. And just a heads up to everyone who might have joined late. Um, we do want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded. So uh, we hope that that's okay with everyone. Um, so we're going to start with Alyssa. Um, and basically, um, my main question for you at this point is what made you decide to become a dual electrical and computer systems engineer? At this point, a lot of the students on this panel are undeclared engineers, and that's why this program exists to kind of help them. And can you tell us a little bit about your journey to finding that you wanted to dual? Yeah, of course. So I actually came into RPI as an undeclared engineer. Um, my school did offer a lot of science and math courses, but not a lot of engineering courses that some high schools offer. So I didn't get a lot of exposure to what the different sorts of engineering were, but I really knew that I loved math and science. So that's kind of why I came into RPI that way. Um, and then when I started taking some of my classes during my first year and looking at uh, some other opportunities and just the courses that really go into each of the degrees, um, I really enjoyed kind of like the physics two side of things. So a lot of the electrical um, portions of, of that science. So that's first what led me towards electrical engineering. Um, but I also really enjoyed doing a little bit of like coding and computer science things. So I initially declared as just an electrical engineer, um, but then I wanted to go take some computer science courses and my advisor had pointed out, hey, you know, there's a lot of overlap between electrical and uh, computer systems. So if you take some of these computer science courses, you could still graduate in four years with this dual degree um, and you'll really be kind of putting those courses to work rather than just kind of taking them as an elective. Uh, and then when I took those courses, I really enjoyed them. Um, so I decided to actually officially do the dual. Um, and I really am doing more kind of the computer digital design computer system side of things now, rather than um, some of the more electrical topics that you might think of as a pure electrical engineer degree. So I'm glad I ended up doing the dual for sure. Excellent, thank you. And Saeed, how did you uh, decide that you wanted to be an electrical engineer? So when I was in high school, for some unknown reason, well, I'm sure there was a good reason, but I don't remember anymore. Um, I picked up electronic, making electronic devices, specifically radios. That was like the technology of the time back then. Um, and I would buy parts and find plans and make stuff. Uh, the only problem was I didn't know why and how they worked. So I got like, I got some books and I got some college notes and started reading them and they made no sense. So I decided, well, I better figure out how this stuff works. And, you know, they say, if uh, you love what you do, you'll never work a day. So I've been kind of doing my hobby for all my career. That's awesome. And Josh, how about you? What was your journey to the point that you're in now in discovering what major to pursue? I came in knowing I would want to do electrical stuff just because I had enjoyed circuit stuff in high school. Uh, and then I actually ended up dual majoring with computer systems as well for a while and then got to the end of my junior year and decided that I wanted to drop the electrical portion of it to take uh, more music and, and computer science focused classes. But definitely taking the dual gave me a lot of exposure to a lot of different things. That was awesome. And that brings up a very valid point to our undeclareds right now. Declaring a dual or a major for that matter is quite seamless at this point. It's a matter of filling out a form. But if you do have any reservations about what you declared or you want to change something because you discovered a dual or something along those lines, that is something you definitely want to have a conversation with your hub advisor about because those are the things we navigate with students every day. Does it make sense to declare? But most of the majors start out very similarly. So yes, the answer could be very easily or it might involve additional coursework, but we could discuss that with you. 
Okay, well, thank you all. Um, now we're going to talk about the day to day stuff. Alyssa, can you tell me what it looks like your daily life as an engineer? Yeah, sure. I think uh, it depends a lot uh, depending on where you are in the design process, but I can talk a little bit about kind of like the three main parts I think about. So, if I'm joining a project at the very beginning of the design process, I'll be doing a lot of um, kind of like architecture design, working closely with a systems engineer, probably computer science, or a software engineer as well. Um, really just trying to plan out what our hardware is going to look like, what the major functional blocks are going to be, um, you know, what kind of device we might need if we're going to try to put this in um, a field programmable gate array, how big does it have to be, those sort of things. Um, and what are we going to put in hardware and what are we going to put in software? So just kind of those high level architecture decisions. So there's a lot of collaboration with other disciplines at this time. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd be doing early on in the design process. When we get into the middle where we're actually kind of implementing some of these things, uh, my day might be involving just kind of writing some hardware description language. You can sort of think of it as coding, but for hardware, you're describing the behavior of hardware. Um, and it's really just describing a circuit. Uh, so you can simulate that, you can test it on uh, an evaluation board, for example, but some of that work would really be in front of a computer more. Uh, and then as we get towards the end of the project where we're actually putting things on hardware, maybe testing things in our lab or going to a customer site um, to test something, we're again kind of not in front of the computer as much and then collaborating a lot more with some of the other disciplines. Um, so that's, that's what my day to day looks like. There's also a lot of um, just like kind of team meetings and collaboration uh, between everyone. I love that you brought up the interdisciplinary piece because that is something that so many students ask, you know, are you locked into a major? Are you working with other electrical engineers? And what does that look like? So thank you for sharing that. Now, the question applies for Saeed as well, but because of your extensive career history, I don't know if you want to pick something current or if you want to talk about something you've done in the past, it's entirely up to you. So I, I figured, well, you know, I kind of, I'm going to pick up where uh, Alyssa left off. I was going to, I was a chip designer in Bell Labs. So I was going to talk about, you know, what was like a day of a person who designed chips. Um, that was a big chunk of my career. Uh, this was before, last time we recognize this, this was the, before the days of VHDL and Verilog. Uh, so, uh, you know, it kind of, but the process has, you know, Alyssa just described it, process hasn't changed. And I was going to mention one of my daughters is an engineer and I talked to her and like she does exactly what I did 100 years ago. So I would spend um, probably the first phase trying to understand the system requirements. Uh, because once you commit something to silicon, uh, changing it is kind of hard. So, uh, very hard. So, uh, and expensive. So I would spend a lot of time understanding the requirements, meeting with a few systems engineers that wrote the requirements, understand like what they're trying to do. So that would be like phase one, just get in your head what they're trying to do. Phase two would be to write up, well, how are you going to approach this design? And I think Alyssa mentioned that. And uh, usually when you're designing a product, what you want to do is you want to figure out how to meet the hardest requirement. Uh, because there's always something that's like really hard and complex. So you would uh, spend time making sure that at least you understand how to do that and then you put everything else around it. And back in those days, unfortunately, things have changed a lot. You spent all day in a room uh, that is dark in front of a green screen uh, capturing your schematic. Um, and uh, the uh, one of the things I discovered was when you look at green in a dark room all night, all day, uh, white looks pink. So one day I was driving home uh, on Route 80 and uh, all of the lines in the center of the highway were pink. That I had the scare of my life. Like what has happened to me until I had a doctor explain to me why. And it was all good. And then, um, then you back in those days, people used to engineers used to type ones and zeros in a terminal for their uh, test pattern for the simulation. And I, being a lazy person, I am. I decided that I was going to write software to generate test patterns and uh, and uh, analyze the results. And that's before world software was available. So that's when I got into software development and just out of necessity of uh, generating test patterns and. Uh, getting results. And uh, then when you were all done, you sent your design to the fab to be built. And when you got it back, you tested it and you hoped that it worked. 
uh, at least until three and a half micron CMOS, you could put it on an air table and poke around in it. Uh, but you know, I, by the time I kind of got done, I was designing in quarter micron CMOS, and that was no longer an option for poking around inside the jet because it's too small. So you have to find other ways. But uh, then when you're all done, you would tie a nice bow on it and turn it in, and you were done, and you'd go on to your next project. Awesome. Thank you. Now, Josh, you just mentioned that you have just come back from your arch away semester. Um, you have the option to share what your experience was like at that internship, or you're more than welcome to just tell us what the day to day looks like as a student entering their senior year, because I think we'd be interested in either. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, uh... My days at work weren't too complicated. I was I was supporting two software projects and one lab project, so most of it was uh, checking out integration of other people's code and spending my free time running collects and and optimizing our lab hardware. Uh, I I think I have an abnormal RPI schedule, but uh, yeah, I, I go to class, uh, have meetings and such for my extracurriculars, and uh, I don't know. I I, I also play. Sports and stuff, so I enjoyed our yeah, There's definitely a lot of balance here. So, if you if people are freshmen here, uh, be sure to go to the activity fair tomorrow and figure out what you can do with your free time. That it all wraps together, like it all helps with the professional development stuff, too. So, you brought up activities fair. So, now we're going to talk about the undergrad careers of every. Involved here, so that's cute. Um, so. If you had internships in your undergrad, um, namely Alyssa and Saeed, um, did you join professional groups, other extracurriculars? Um, and, uh, you know, relevance to, um, you want to share that with me? You're cutting out a little bit, but I um, think I got, got the gist of the question. So it. During my time at RPI, I was part of the Tau Beta Pi and Eta Kappa Nu groups, which are honor societies for engineering and more specifically for electrical and computer engineering. Um, so you got to do a lot of community service as part of those and kind of get to know some of the department heads. Um, so it's not necessarily a group you get to choose to join, but uh, if you work hard, you can end up being part of this group and it's really great for networking and um, things like that. So I enjoyed being part of those. Uh, other time outside of school, I, I did play the clarinet uh, when I was at RPI, so I was uh, just in a kind of club band there and then also participated in the, the pep band, so I went to a lot of the sports games, specifically hockey for that. Um, and I also played intramural soccer while um, I was at RPI, so another great way to, you know, get some energy out and um, meet some new people. Uh, and then the question about internships, um, I did an internship my uh, junior year into my senior year at uh, the company I currently work for. And they offered me a job at the end of the uh, internship. So I think that was a really good uh, timing. It's a great way to check out a company and see if you actually want to work there. Um, and it felt really good to know I had a job before I went into my senior year. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to reread the question. Um, if, if, if I cut out again, please let me know. Um, so, Saeed, this was what I read before. Um, what does your undergraduate experience look like? Did you have internships and join professional groups, other extracurriculars? And can you make any recommendations for organizations or clubs to our current students? Sure, get involved. Um, so personally, I would mentioned in passing to my chemistry professor freshman year that I'd done the figures for my high school math teacher's new book. So he said, I have a job for you. So I ended up, uh, being a draftsman for Professor Jans for four years at 80 bucks a week. So I kind of earned my beer money that way. Uh, that's back when you could drink beer uh, when you were 18. Um, anyways, uh, so that was uh, kind of uh, my, uh, you know, kind of running uh, job for four years undergraduate. Uh, I was also a brother at Alpha Phi Omega APO back, back in those days, we had to use book sale. And uh, I was a member of the outing club and I spent a lot of weekends in the Adirondacks and in the Catskills. Uh, so you study all week and work hard and stay up late. And then on weekends, uh, go and kind of clear your head. Uh, and I played soccer in 
uh, intramurals, and also played soccer for uh, in Detroit Ethnic League uh, for Azuri Detroit. I was an honorary Italian for three years and an honorary Irishman for one. Uh, and uh, I coached the uh, boys club soccer team, and uh, some of those boys are still my, they're open now, they're my friends still. Uh, and uh, since you guys mentioned materials, one of them was uh, Kirk Van Ness, who was son of Professor Van Ness, who taught materials so, uh, back in those days. And uh, in the Oven Club, I kind of met a lot of graduate students in the EE department, and through them, I got to know a whole bunch of electrical engineering faculty. And I ended up getting three projects, all of them paid tuition for graduate school. Uh, kind of through that route, and that's I ended up getting my tuition paid for graduate school. And I was member of Ada Kappa Nu, and that's where I met my wife. She's also an RPI electrical engineer. Um, anyways, but that's kind of my uh, extracurricular activities. I feel like you should be here all the time. <laughs> Your whole life involved RPI. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> As an aside, me, my two brothers, and my wife are all RPI graduates. That's amazing. Okay. Um, Checks to RPI. <laughs> Josh, you want to weigh in on this? You touched on it a little bit before. You want to elaborate? Yeah, sure. Uh, I also misspoke. The activity fair is Wednesday. It's not tomorrow. But um, <laughs> yeah, I'm in Engineering Ambassadors, which is like a presentation club here on campus. Uh, we go to like local schools and talk about engineering. I am on the club frisbee team. I play clarinet as well with the orchestra, wind symphony, and the chamber group this semester. Uh, I'm pretty actively involved in my fraternity. We definitely recommend Greek life if you're looking to uh, get your head out of school sometimes and make some great connections during your college experience. And I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, yeah, through Engineering Ambassadors, uh, last year I was able to get a research position on campus uh, because someone, one of the advisors for Engineering Ambassadors knew uh, someone at the Lisa Center. So. Getting involved with clubs could also help you make connections on campus during your time in undergrads. I don't have to think about career all the time, but that was great. Right through the summer arch and right through the fall semester after, I was able to do research. So, good experience. Excellent. So, what you're seeing here is all three of our panelists are heavily involved in things that are not exclusively engineering. So we try to tell our students that employers look at the big picture. They want to see that you have a life outside of engineering and the activities fair, which is this Wednesday, because it was rescheduled from the weekend is a great opportunity to explore some of the clubs that everyone mentioned, the outing club and the Frisbee club, anything else. Um, you know, definitely check those out. You don't have to get involved in a ton of them. Even just one or two is a great thing to, to look into. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the actual curriculum because a lot of times students come into the hub and they're like, do I really need these courses all for my major? Like, why am I taking this if it's not relevant? Um, so. Do you find very often students, like I said, ask us if the courses that are required for their major are used in the workplace? Do you find that to be true, Alyssa and Saeed? And if so, can you elaborate on the specifics? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say some courses more than others. Uh, I especially use all, almost all the courses I took my junior and senior year, which were more the elective courses. Um, I use them day to day. So things like digital signal processing, uh, image processing, um, some of the uh, FPGA courses I took, those are things I use every single day, but in order to understand that material, you really had to take some of those courses in your freshman and sophomore year to build a foundation to even take those courses. Um, so kind of from that perspective, I'd say probably 75% of what I, the courses I took at RPI, I use almost every day, um, in the workplace. Uh, and then some of the ones that I don't necessarily use every day, they still give me some kind of background knowledge on how to talk to other engineers. Um, and just really understand some of our hardware or products on a broader scale, even if I'm not necessarily working on the detailed portions of the design every day. Great, thank you. And Saeed, what your perspective is? Sure. Um, I spent a chunk of my career as an analog circuit designer, as I was designing power supplies. For some reason, I kind of got into that groove. And um, my active circuit text and my pulse and timing text were like my forever companions. 
And funny thing is, I would open them up to read a chapter, and I said to myself, hey, when I was at RPI and I read this chapter, this stuff was never there. Which, you know, when you're in a work environment, you, when you really need to know this stuff, it's really helpful. In my chip design days, um, my fundamentals of logic design course was like absolute essential, kind of like you got to know that stuff. Um, the other thing is, um, at least a lot of stuff I did was math heavy. Um, so um, um, math was super useful. The other thing you might want to think about is, um, see, I made some notes here. Um, even if you look at some of the modern technology, I ran a conversational AI company. And if you think, if you're talking about like machine learning classifiers, uh, like when I took uh, detection and estimation theory, graduate year, uh, the mathematics of Bayes decision criteria are exactly what are the mathematics of naive Bayes algorithm and the mathematics of the radar problem of how do you know if the radar is about, if a plane is about to bomb you or not, are identical to what's called the maximum entropy classifier. Um, and by the way, you wouldn't know what an entropy was unless you took information theory. So like you wouldn't even, as Alyssa pointed out, you wouldn't even have the vocabulary to talk to other people who do this stuff. Or, uh, you know, in um, deep learning machines, um, words are represented at somewhere either 80 or 300 dimensional vectors unless you took linear algebra you wouldn't know what they were you wouldn't know like you know how to work with them so at least the way i look at it is uh is that um is that it's kind of you don't know what's going to happen next you don't know where you're going to land and at least i my 50 years i've worked in industries that went away and I had to go work in a different industry. Um, so you kind of need to go back, and even if you don't need it now, you'll need it later. Anyways, but that's been my experience. Kind of like, it's all useful. Oh, and one thing is uh, digital communication, Bruce Carlson's class, you know, that text, I just did nothing but that for two years. This is all really helpful. This is helpful for me. Uh, Josh, what's your perspective? Um, did you have any relevant coursework in your internship? Yeah, definitely. I actually chose to stay here instead of pursuing an internship after my sophomore year to take signals and systems over the summer and then take DSP in the fall so that I could get into signal processing because I knew that I didn't want to do power electronics, which is kind of like a lot of entry level internships end up with like more circuit board and like power electronics focused thing um yeah so I, even the classes that i didn't end up using like they helped push me in the right direction so and i, I didn't feel like anything was irrelevant to electrical engineering it's uh, definitely not so yeah great thank you now um we also have electives Al Alyssa mentioned electives Saeed mentioned linear algebra, which could be used as like a technical elective in the curriculum. Um, are there electives, even outside of engineering, that you find specifically would strengthen your market marketability as a graduate seeking employment? Uh, Alyssa, you want to start with that question? Sure. I'll mention one inside of engineering first. So even if you're not uh, going under computer systems and you're just going to be a pure electrical engineer, I'd highly, highly I recommend you take a computer science course. I think you're required to at least take intro to CS, but um, even taking like one more higher than that, uh, you can use it everywhere just for data analysis and uh, it, it can really help your job be more efficient. Uh, and a lot of places are looking for skills. You'd be able to code in at least like Python or MATLAB or something equivalent to that. Um, outside of engineering, uh, I'd say a course like engineering management, I think is maybe what one was called when I was uh, there, but talking about kind of like just like project management, schedule, budget, um, like how to run a program. Um, although you probably won't be running a program right when you join a company, uh, like right out of school, I think they're really important skills to have to understand how a project is run um, and then potentially allow you to become a leader uh, of a project later on in your career. Awesome, thank you. Saeed, do you have any recommendations of elective coursework outside of linear algebra, which I highly hear feedback from the department that that class is particularly helpful, so. Back in my days, linear algebra was required. 
You couldn't get be an engineer. You couldn't get an engineering degree without it. Anyways, by the way, to Alyssa's point, what I have on my background on the right, you see the blue and white coils. Those are all RF circuits. They operate in the two to thirty megahertz band. Uh, what's next to it here is an analog circuit, and what's next to that is a system on a chip, and it implements a whole bunch of digital signal processing algorithms programmed in C. So I would say today, if you're going in the market, and uh, let's say you can have a different opinion, you really can't be an electrical engineer without knowing computer science. I mean, like the two are inseparable. And at least in my career, I saw custom hardware move to programmable DSPs, move to, hey, these computers are fast enough. We need to don't need to build anything special. Just don't run the software on them. So that is, you know, in my career, happened. but the two things I, other than, and by the way, in general, depending on what area you want to specialize in, I would say you need more math rather than less math. If you're like, for example, like uh, Josh, if you're going signal processing, you're going to probably need a whole lot more math than less math. Um, but the two things I want to point out, one of them is business. If you have any interest in business and RPI has a lot of offers, get a sense of, you know, take a course or two here and there. I took micro and macro and took money in banking uh, when I was at RPI and it, I've always found it useful. Um, and, uh, like when people talk about inflation, I actually know what they're talking about. So it allows it like helps you be a good citizen, but also helps you in the business environment, especially if you have any ambitions to move into business side. And to kind of uh, add to Alyssa's point on projects, you got to like get some stuff about what makes people tick. Because at the end of the day, a business is people who have ideas, people who produce the product, people who sell them, and people who buy them and use them. So a business is people. So you kind of have to study people. And at least what I've found is the ancients knew more about people because they didn't have distractions. Uh, and they wrote eloquently about what makes people tick. So learn about what makes people tick. Thank you. And just for everybody's reference, um, the econ courses that Saeed referenced, those are actually perfect for the economics pathway that all students are required to do at this point. Micro and money and banking and principles of econ would be a pathway. So that could be something you could talk about if any of you are interested in taking principles of econ as a Haas inquiry course. And as far as management courses are concerned, they are available. They're not Haas classes, but every curriculum outside of dual degrees just because we use free electives to make the dual more manageable, but every singular curriculum has free electives that allow you to explore the courses that have been mentioned as electives. So if any of those resonate with you and you want to have a bigger discussion, reach out to your hub advisor. Now, Josh, what's your perspective on those? Um, and also, do you feel like the professional development classes that we offer are a little bit of a touch point for learning about people? Yeah, for sure. Because if you're going to walk into a room and work with people, kind of know them. To, you're lead a project or be part of a project, or you're going to depend on somebody else to do in their work so you can do your work, uh, you know, you kind of have to like know how people work. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, I will say uh, I've had a lot of success in interviews because I spent a lot of time practicing with myself and learning like the star method and how to answer questions with the like the smart ways, right? Where you're giving specific and measurable achievements that you did. And that was not really introduced until the PD classes. I think IED has like some PD one aspect to it where they maybe touch on that. But I mean, I'm taking PD three now, which is in, in the schedule, I think it's put in your senior year. And that's like, we're starting off with like 60 second cells and mock interviews and things. And like, you could just take that before you're trying to find your arch, like if you can just take the PD classes early, I think they'll be very beneficial for you um, in that sense. And then, yeah, definitely I agree with the computer science and business aspects of pursuing things here. I'll say just like, I've always been fascinated with music and I picked the music pathway like immediately coming here. And then I just found people to talk to and had no idea that there was options for electrical engineers to work in music. I was just like, I'm gonna make this happen. And now I'm taking like an architectural 
like applied psychoacoustics class where it's like me and like four PhD students and like two other undergrads. And like, I had no idea something like that would exist at RPI. And out of the like thousand plus kids in my class, there's no way I would have talked to those other two kids about it. So like exploring opportunities and filling in your electives. If there's something that interests you, just do it and you can make it work. Love that. Thank you. So um, our next question could be similarly combined. Um, it's about minors. Have any of you pursued minors? And if so, can you tell us about that? You want to start, Alyssa? Yeah, I didn't uh, do a minor while I was at RPI. The dual was, uh, you know, taking up enough of my time. So I can't add too much here. Fair enough. <laughs> Said, did you do a minor? I didn't do a minor per se, but when I was, by the time I finished my senior year, I had enough credits in the math department to get a degree in math, or had enough credits in the EE department to get a degree in EE. And back in those days, there were like there was no way to make a living as a mathematician. So I took the EE degree today with all that machine learning stuff running around. I could have made some serious money, but like I was a little too early for that. So, yeah, no, I, if you call that minor, but it, like, like, I didn't do a minor. I just took courses over there. Great, thank you. And Josh, are you in pursuit of a minor at this point? Yep, I'm doing a music minor here. I think, I mean, the pathways are 12 credits and the minor is 16 credits. So if you're doing a pathway, you can probably get a minor out of it. Like, you, you can structure that. That is part of Haas's evil plan. Everybody should have a Haas minor before they graduate with the pathway implementation. So I don't even, if anybody, it's, not, go it's ahead. never going to come down to you in an interview saying like, they're like, oh, we're balancing you with this other candidate. And you're like, well, actually I'm a music minor. And they're like, well, why are we even balancing? Obviously you're the qualified one. Like, it's not going to turn out like that. It's just a way of putting a little stamp on saying, yes, I've taken enough coursework to actually understand this as a field. Like I didn't focus in it, but. I could be beneficial if you're doing things related to it, right? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And this is where um, probably what people don't want to talk about, but what classes did you struggle with at RPI? There's always going to be at least one, so everybody share. And um, what resources or tactics did you use to overcome that difficulty? Sure. Um... My course that I didn't like the most and I uh, did the worst in was probably strength of materials, which was like an engineering core class that I took in a different discipline. Um, and this was still while I was undeclared engineering. So I think it was actually a really good path for me to understand that, you know, what, I don't think civil or mechanical engineering is really for me. Um, so it was a good learning experience that way. Um, I just wasn't as motivated in the course because I wasn't as interested in it. So I spent you know less time than I probably should have on it. Um, and I wasn't as familiar with some of the concepts. They didn't come to me as uh, you know quickly as some of the electrical or computer science courses did. Um, so I did have to go to like office hours and talk to some other students in my class to try to you know get back up to speed on everything. Um, yeah. It has a notorious reputation here anyway, but uh... How about you, Saeed? Uh, yeah, I, I gotta admit. So it was what you call today fields and waves back in those days. It was called electromagnetic theory. And Professor Bradshaw was the professor. And uh, I was doing badly and it was a course in my major. So I went to see Professor Bradshaw towards the end of the semester. And I said, uh, Professor Bradshaw, I can't do badly in this course. He said, I will give you a challenge. If you derive Snell's laws, that's like the equations that show how light is reflected off, off of mirrors and refracted through uh, uh, lenses and whatnot. So Maxwell's equations, which, do, which control all electromagnetic propagation, including light, if you derive that, which completely ruined my Christmas vacation, I will give you an A. Uh, he didn't know that I've taken all these math courses and that's like a math problem. That's not an electrical engineering problem. Uh, so I got an A, but uh, I had to, but that's kind of a, uh, you have to go and say like, you gotta, you gotta help me out here. Uh, otherwise I was not going to graduate with that, with that lower degree, a lower grade in my own major. Thank you for that. And self advocacy, we can't say it enough because you never yeah. know oh, what yeah. a professor oh. might say, right? <laughs> uh, and it's one of those things I've never forgotten. 
it's an awesome story. <laughs> How about you, Josh? What what is uh, standing out to you as something that you didn't particularly enjoy here? <laughs> I'm gonna have to go with fields and woods as well. Uh, that the last fall I took that, and I kind of I, I took physics two over the summer at a public school uh, in order to get ahead. And I think that was a bad class to choose to take over the summer at a public school because they didn't teach it to me. Uh, and when it came to EM theory, I had no background and that class does not move slowly whatsoever. So uh, I, I ended up passing up crediting that and do not have credit for it. And then when I dropped the EE, I no longer had to took it. But then I went, you know, immediately after taking that class, went and worked as a digital communications engineer for seven months working on radios. So. Sometimes, you know, I, I was never going to be the one designing the waveforms. I can be the one implementing them in software, right? So you just have to find what that niche is for you. And uh, now I know that I don't actually like EM stuff at all, and I'd rather stick with, you know, zero to 20,000 hertz instead of five gigahertz or whatever. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that was just a pass for me. We, we hear that a lot. Um, Fields and Waves does have a reputation as well. It's kind of like the strength of materials for EEs and yeah. <laughs> so the other um, topic that I want to talk about is after graduation. Um, Alyssa mentioned that she got her master's degree at WPI and um, I wanted to know if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, students often hear about the co-term program at um, here. So can you tell us what your experience was like? Yeah, so um, I joined the company I currently work for, BAE Systems, as part of a leadership development program they have for entry-level um, engineers. And as part of that program, uh, they require you to go get a master's degree, and, but they pay for it. So a lot of companies will offer something like that. Um, they'll offer tuition assistance once you join a company. Um, so it's one good path that you can think about if you're interested in getting a master's, but maybe um, don't want to pay for it. Uh, but because I was doing it that way, I was working full time and then also getting the master's at the same time. So it was much more of a time commitment, I guess I'd say, in terms of my overall life and free time. Um, so it it was definitely kind of like the busiest three years. I did it over um, three years. So I graduated in 2020 and uh, I did have an opportunity to go in person to courses if I wanted to. But I'd say I think I did almost all but one course um, online. Um, so I didn't enjoy it as much as kind of the in-person courses that I got to do at RPI, um, but I did get to, you know, get it paid for and I really took courses that were more specific to what I was actually doing at work. Um, so once you are in the workforce and you know kind of what path you want to go down, you can really tell what courses are going to be more relevant to that. Um, so I liked kind of taking a year before I went to go take that master's to understand maybe where what my options were and what my path should be. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Saeed, can you tell me a little bit about your journey from undergrad to graduate? Sure. Um, let's see. Um, my interest, my main, my main interest was in communications. Uh, so kind of the coursework was signals and systems, communication, digital communication. Um, detection estimation theory, which for which you needed random processes, information theory. That was, and there was no way you're going to cram that stuff in four years. Uh, so I kind of took one look at it and I said, okay. Uh, and also, um, some of them were just actual graduate courses. You couldn't take them as undergraduate. Uh, so what I did is, uh, I actually, and kind of, there was an economic analysis in there too, because. Graduate courses are by credit hour and undergraduate courses are flat rate. I like you pay tuition. So I like crammed as much as I could into my senior year. Uh, so I have a light graduate year. And uh, also a lot of students have struggled to finish their master's thesis. Um, and that dragged on and because you just didn't have enough time. I took one course over the summer. So when I entered my graduate year, uh, I only had courses Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, and I spent the rest of my time doing my master's project. And uh, and I actually paid one of the department secretaries a dollar a page to type it for me. Uh, how things have changed, uh, but uh, but that was kind of my uh, plan for a graduate school because I needed the just for what I was interested in doing. I needed the coursework, and you couldn't fit it in four years. 
uh, especially with all that math tangent that I'd taken uh, undergraduate. Uh, so that was kind of, uh, and I ended up getting like three proposals from three two professors, Modestino and Gerhardt, and I ended up doing a project for uh, Professor Gerhardt, which was tracking man-made objects against natural background without using uh, radar. So. Uh, like uh, ships against uh, ocean, planes against the sky, soldiers against forests, that kind of stuff. Uh, anyways, that was kind of uh, how I ended up uh, with a master's degree. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I need better adjectives other than awesome, but that's all I feel right now. <laughs> um, Josh, can you tell me what your intentions are, if you don't mind sharing? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm going away again. Uh, and I don't know how Tesla works with helping people with graduates. I'd assume they have something with that, but uh, the company I was just at, MITRE, they do a similar uh, thing to VA systems where you, you go in and they give you time and they pay for you to, to work on your project or whatever you're doing for your, for your master's. Uh, if I were to return to a research-based role, then I would definitely end up going to grad school. But um, I don't know. One thing about the plus one program is it's kind of hard to fit in if you're graduating in the fall and you can't like, it's meant for you to take that first semester in the fall and then your second semester in the spring. So I could see myself uh, coming back in the following year after graduating and doing a plus one or doing it at another school, but I have not decided that yet. That's fair. Okay. Um, we're going to move on. We're going to, um, Talk about internships and co-ops since we're kind of on that topic already. When do you feel, um, do you have advice for students who want to pursue internships and co-ops? With the ARCH program, there is a semester that's specifically carved out for students to have those opportunities if they want to pursue them. But when do you feel is a good time to start and when did you guys start during your academic careers? I started looking early, I think after my freshman year, um, but it was kind of hard to get something at that point. Uh, so I really started or actually got something after my sophomore and junior years. Um, and I, I think those are great times because you've gotten a few courses under your belt. You maybe have a little more experience um, and you maybe even started to kind of specialize under something so you can actually see what it would be like to work under that um, kind of concentration out in the workforce. Um, I know a lot of companies do summer internships, but uh, you know, my company also offers co-ops. Uh, so I think you could probably work it either way. And Saeed, what, what would you recommend students do if they're interested in internships or co-ops? I've never been an intern, but I've had lots and lots of interns over the years. So I can kind of speak from an employer's perspective. And it's kind of a combination of uh, what has been said already. Uh, and one of them is like, you got to know enough that you can make a meaningful contribution. Um, and the other thing is there are co-op and uh, internship opportunities if you don't have a lot of experience, but they typically are, you know, in the electric power industry, in the construction industry, go get coffee kind of uh, internships. And uh, I don't know if that's going to help anybody or not. Uh, but um, the other thing about starting early, one of the possibilities are if you start early in researching what you might want to do is you might be able to organize your courses uh, that between your electives and your required courses, uh, maybe you could kind of get yourself in a position that you could do it a little sooner than later. Uh, but the other thing I would do is I would start in some of the, like the professional development, interviewing, the resume building, uh, what makes you a great employee. It takes a while to get that right, especially if you don't have any experience and you're like in school. Uh, I mean, that stuff doesn't come natural to us. I mean, like we weren't born that way. Uh, it kind of, you gotta, you gotta work at it. So the chances are you're gonna like be wrong a few times. So you wanna like start early and, uh, uh, we're planning our uh, 50th reunion next year, this year, starting this year, because it gives us many opportunities to be wrong uh, and uh, go down the dead ends and then start again. Uh, so I would say those are probably some of the key things. Uh, I, I was in Atlanta last week and I did a quick survey of electrical engineering internship jobs. And there was a ton of them. There was just on LinkedIn, there was like 470. And a bunch of them were in micron semiconductors, designing memory chips. 
And uh, there were 30 RPI alumni in that plant. So, um, you know, figure out how to build your, uh, build your network and build some skills on how to do this kind of stuff. That's great advice. Thank you. And Josh, what about you? Um, having done one just recently, you want to tell us what your timeline looks like? Okay, I, I'll try to keep this brief because I could talk about this for like an hour. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, my number one tip is handshake, handshake, handshake. Because everyone I know who had a full co-op during their arts, like who actually enjoyed their art semester away, got it through handshake. So update yourself there. Put on notifications for any company that you might even be vaguely interested in. Uh, that's the only reason I ever got an interview uh, for for Tesla is because I had notifications on for them, and I applied like 30 minutes after they posted this job, specifically for RPI students. Um, then interviewed like the next week. So that's the only, they're not going to look at you on LinkedIn. Passing off of that, if you use LinkedIn, you shouldn't just be applying on their site and leaving it. You should apply and then you should message like four or five people from that company and be like, hey, I just applied. None of them are going to respond to you, but it's good practice. And if they do respond, it'll end up well. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess if you're looking to go away for the summer, you need to be looking in the fall, you need to be applying in the fall. Uh, and if you can maintain a portfolio website or something else that you can back up your credentials with, very, very useful. I've had multiple interviews where we just scrolled through my website and talked about my projects, and those often end up much better than the ones where they're like, I see on your resume, you put five words that you like did this thing. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's much harder to, to not work with pictures and things like that. Yeah. That's great advice as well. And, th and congratulations on your Tesla opportunity, because that's that's going to be amazing. Um, so. Basically, we're in summary mode at this point. Um, do you have additional advice for a student, perhaps in this audience, who's considering a computer systems or electrical engineering major, or even the dual? Um, what would be your advice to them at this point? You want to start, Alyssa? Sure. I was just going to say that uh, you can apply electrical engineering concepts or computer systems engineering concepts to so many different applications, and you can really go into so many different fields. Um, you know, anything ranging from like aerospace to medical to automotive to I don't know, whatever you think of, there's probably some electrical engineering task there. So um, I think it's definitely something you should consider, even if you have a passion in a specific discipline or application area. Yeah, I, I mean, kind of let me pick up on that, what Alyssa said. I mean, kind of from my experience, um, there's just no limit. And uh, and the industries, I mean, just, you know, for Rama, we did a uh, uh, managing your brand online workshop. And I, like, done some research on electrical engineering job opportunities. I mean, as Alyssa mentioned, it's just almost infinite, uh, every, you know, because... Anytime you have a product, you need to control it. You need to have some displays. You need to have some user interface. You need to have some smarts. And that's all electrical and computer systems engineering. And it shows up everywhere. Also, I have a ton of friends who are in the banking and in the finance industry. Almost any area that requires analytical skills. So not only you have, as a matter of fact, one of my advisees from like three, four years ago, uh, I'm a graduate of the EE department. He's actually a financial analyst for a hedge fund in San Francisco. Uh, so, you know, it's not only um, all in engineering field, if you like making stuff, uh, like some of us here do, um, but there is also um, kind of, if you get bored with that or you want to do something else, uh, the number of opportunities are huge. And then there's the whole software industry that you can kind of go into, and like that's another uh, huge uh, industry. And the other thing is, kind of like the where the world is going is one of two places: either it's electronics or it's biology. So like you know, take your pick. And most people who are good at one are not very good at the other. I certainly wasn't very good at biology and chemistry. So if you're good at this stuff, this is the place to be. If you're not good at this stuff, then you should find something else to do. Yeah, and I just say, like, uh, if any of you are in, like, intro to ECSC, uh, you'll know this already, but, like, a lot of, especially in a, the ECSC department, uh, I see coursework as, like, giving you tools 
to you know go and create things and complete projects and things. So if you just do your courses and you just finish your tests and you understand the theory and then just leave it, uh, that won't be very useful for you. But if you take the time to go outside of your classwork and find YouTube videos, people doing projects, and like attempt to recreate them or just show your curiosity in some way, it will both make you appreciate the coursework that you're taking more and drive your curiosity for, for your further courses. And it will also help you uh, maybe even be an inspiration for your friends and, and uh, give you a passion that will help you land a job that you'd like to land and be excited about it. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> so to uh, be you know, considerate of everybody's time, I want to open up the panel to student questions. But before I do that, I also want to just mention, um, I, I don't believe I formally introduced myself. My name is Karen Lewis and I'm the manager of the hub and Jen Yeager's on here as well. She is the ECSC advisor. So she advises both electrical and computer systems. And then if there's any duels that come along with it, uh, you can connect with either one of us to discuss this in more detail if you're considering a change. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. And also, uh, does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Um, thank you all for joining us today because I think what you shared with us is incredible information about the majors and also a little bit about RPI and, and you make it fun. So I appreciate you guys being on today. What questions do you guys have for our panelists? You could put it in the chat or if you want, you can simply unmute your microphone and ask directly at this point. Karen, there was a question um, from Evan and it said, is it possible to go straight into the workforce with a bachelor's? I want to work on the hardware side. What are the possibilities uh, at the bachelor's level? Yeah, I mean, I went right in with the bachelor's. Uh, I know the program I was talking about says that you're going to go get a master's, but um, a lot of people that I was working with just come in entry level with a bachelor's degree. So yeah, that's definitely possible. I agree. I agree. Just depends on what area you want to specialize in. Hardware design, straightforward. And typically, like when you're looking at job postings, like an entry level engineer, and you'll have like entry level, intermediate, and like senior level. So if you were to go to grad school and get like a master's, maybe you could be hired at an intermediate level. Or if you were to get a PhD, you're probably looking to get hired at the senior level. But if you were to just stay and work at the entry level and get promoted to those positions, it's a similar timeline. And you probably, you know, it's just different applications, but yeah, totally. Josh just reminded me of my argument with my dad in 1975. Uh, investment as a PhD, as if you want to go into industry, is probably not a good investment. Um, he was trying to talk me into going to get a PhD and said, that not a good investment. Any other questions? Everybody's quiet. Well, I'm going to ask one of my questions. Um, looking back at freshman year, can you tell us something that you wish you knew first time as a student? Um, I think, I, I think this is something Josh already kind of talked about, but I think you can get really focused freshman year on just like doing really well in your courses and that's your main focus. Um, but I think you should really take time to get involved in both clubs, but also just kind of doing a few projects on the side to implement some of the things you've been learning in class. Um, if you aren't doing a ton of projects in your coursework. Uh, I think those are, can be really valuable in helping you decide where you want to go and then just also building a really good network at the school. Um, the one thing that I wish I knew, I knew nothing about business. Everybody in my family was either a teacher or in the professions in medical or legal industries. Uh, so I didn't know anything about like where money came from. And if I had known that, but like you got to sell something to like pay people. Uh, I would have probably taken a different. Uh, I had to learn that over the years the hard way.
And that's, by the way, talking to a guy who ran a $600 million business. So it took me a while to figure that out. Um, I guess one thing that I think is important to keep in mind is like, um, it's really hard. If you manage to do well academically in your freshman year, it is really hard to lower your GPA significantly in further years, because if you manage to get a 4.0, if you get like all C's in your sophomore year and you get a 2.0, you're still at a 3.0, right? But that goes both ways. So you have to be careful with your freshman year. I have a lot of friends who got very low grades in their freshman year. And it's very, very hard to climb back up. Um, I think, yeah, join clubs, do things, but don't let it affect your schoolwork either. By the way, one thing I say to all our student send offs, and when we have student send off at a Princeton Club in New Jersey, and we usually have about 50 to 100 students, which is go to class, take notes, and do homework. Those are like the three secrets of RPI. It's great that that's a secret. <laughs> But it's true. That's and and also I, I'm going to make a plug for the hub here. But if you guys are struggling academically and it doesn't matter what major you are, seek out help because we know where the resources are to find that and we can point you in the right directions because we don't want to see you fail in the first year. We want to support you and and empower you to make great decisions while you're here. So definitely use us as a resource moving forward. Thank you guys. That's that's all great advice. Um, any other questions? Anyone else have anything else they want to bring up? I have a question that the students can contemplate. They don't need to answer it, which is how what do you envision for your future? Like, do you envision yourself to be a professor or a researcher or like a bench engineer at a big company or a corporate executive? Or do you think you want to join a startup or like start your own business? Uh, have you considered anything else? So that's like a question that is kind of worthwhile kind of thinking about, uh, you know, like not every day, but from time to time. And uh, then start seeking like, okay, if that's my goal, uh, what's the path to that goal? So maybe that's kind of something to think about. I think I'll piggyback on that and say, um, when you have, when you form connections with people here and you talk to other people, bring up that question to them as well. Because I only recently learned that one of my close friends is planning on like never joining a company and he's just like dead set on starting his own thing. He's like, I got the capital, like I'm great. I'm getting out of here and I'm using my knowledge, my connections to build my own thing. And he's so dead set on it. I've never met anyone who's that dead set on it. And that's not even like, I see myself going into more of a, an existing company. So that wasn't even a thought in my mind, but there's so many people here with different thoughts and different ideas. If you, if you just have those conversations, it can be very enlightening. I've done both. So it's, there's value in both. Uh, but there are, you know, there's huge rewards for running your own business. Scary too. Having to make payroll is also an interesting problem. Every month, got to make payroll. Econ pathway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have a question here. Uh, what do signal processing engineers do? Sure, uh, I can talk a little bit about that. So, um, I tend to, so there there are two different groups that are my company. Um, there's like a group of engineers who kind of develop algorithms um, and try to solve problems with them, and then there's a group who try to implement those algorithms on actual hardware systems uh, or software systems, right? So, uh, an important part of this that I, I use my background in signal processing and digital signal processing for is, you know, how are we actually going to implement these things? on an FPGA or on a, a microprocessor or something like that. So some of the applications uh, that I've worked in are things like radar, um, communication theory. So you can think of uh, like any sort of radio or transceiver or like your cell phone. Um, and then uh, image processing is another big one, like infrared imaging, or like if you think of cars and how they're self-driving cars, there's a lot of uh, image and signal processing going on there. So it's really taking in a signal um, 
processing it in some way and, and making better information out of it to make some sort of decision. This, if I may add, you know, kind of another way to think about that, everything you just said is that their signals in the world are all analog. I mean, they're like voltages or currents or whatever, or, or pressure from some uh, weight of something. And, but these days, like nobody kind of puts resistors and diodes and capacitors and tries to figure out what to do with these signals, whether, uh, whether detecting ones and zeros from deep space or whatever. So the first thing you do is you convert them to a digital signal, uh, you know, like a number, uh, and then you hand it over to Alyssa, and she does her magic with them and gets you the answer. So digital signal processing is kind of everything, because we just like do everything digital. Yeah, a good example is like. Uh... For an audio perspective, like active noise cancellation, you have a microphone, which is digitizing some audio, right? And then it is reproducing that sound at a different speaker at a very, very specific interval to cancel out the existing sound. So you have to understand the whole system you're working with. There's a lot of interesting math going on there. And it's a, I, I just love it because it's so like, like look at the signals, you can see what's happening. That's the only part of electrical engineering that you can actually look at and make sense of. Oh, it's good. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, do we have any other questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay, we'll give it another minute. But again, I want to thank you guys for coming today. Uh, I feel like we all shared a lot of helpful information and hopefully uh, students will have some more questions to the hub and we can definitely uh, follow up if there's anything else that moves forward that you guys have questions about as well. Um, 